So I'm going to tell you what makes me lie awake at night. A couple of nights ago, for some odd reason, I was thinking about frogs. And there are, there are certain species, certain flavors of frogs that um, they come with suction pads on their, on their toes and their fingers. And, and with them, they can climb up surfaces that uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to. And that's a, that's a really amazing thing. And then I started thinking, well, why is it that these, these frogs, these toads, whatever, uh, they don't get stuck to things, you know, they're just walking along and step on a wet rock and suddenly they're there and, and, and they can't move. They have to wait for the rain to come and wash them away or something. And uh, so I was actually laying in bed and I was, um, I was kind of grieving and, and weeping for these, these millions of frogs all over the world that are just stuck to things and, and can't set themselves free. And uh, so I started thinking about it and I realized that I was thinking about their suction cups Kind of like this sort of thing, you know, we, we use these to, uh, you know, put a little sun catcher in the window or something like that. And once you stick it on something, it, it's, it's on there, right? They're, they're not going to go away uh, anytime soon. But it, it occurred to me that the, the frogs have to be able to let go. So I started thinking about the mechanism by which that would work. And, you know, a, as I thought about it, I kind of thought, okay, well, they stick their sticker or their uh, suction cup against something. And then they, they flex it, right? Because they have muscles. They, they flex a little bit. They make it concave. And that's what gives them the suction. And you know, when they want to let go, they just kind of relax. And, and this is the, uh, the method by which they grab onto things, right? And we've actually replicated it. We, we have suction pads like this. And you, you might recognize this as something that you would use for um, maybe putting a GPS on your windscreen or to hold your phone. This one's for my, uh, for my camera. And also we see something similar with uh, uh, people who, who work with glass, who install glass, because it's hard to carry huge sheets of glass. So they use these suction cups to carry them. Maybe if you have a really exciting life, you uh, you might use something like this to climb a building, you know, like in some spy movie. But basically the way it works is the same as the frog, right? That we, we put it on and by flicking this lever, I, I've just created a, a convex surface within. And basically what I've done here is I've intentionally created a nothing. I've created a region of nothing within here because of course it was flat. There was nothing really in between the, the two surfaces. And then when we create the space, there's, there's nothing in there. But the interesting thing is that this nothing actually affects the something because th this has got a really good hold on my uh, uh, hourglass here. But there's no glue, right? There, there's no hook, there's, no, there's nothing grabbing. So it's actually the existence of that little region of nothing is what's holding the something. And that kind of, uh, uh, in some ways, it defies our normal logical reasoning, right? Because nothing, there, there's no mass, there's no force, there's no substance, there, there's, there's no thing there, right? And yet, the only thing that is lifting this up right now is, in fact, the no thing. It's the nothing, that is actually exerting force on the something. So that, that's, a, that's a little bit weird for us to think about because nothingness is, uh, it's not a self-independent state. Like there, you can't have nothing without something. You can have something without nothing, right? So I can, I can have a thing and I don't need a, a nothing beside it for it to exist. But for nothing to exist, there has to be a something, right? There, there has to be uh, like a, a boundary, um, some point at which the nothingness stops and something begins. So um, e even just to just say that nothing exists, it's a self-contradictory statement. And yet this nothing that is in this space actually quite clearly does exist because it's lifting my, uh, my hourglass. So something can exist without nothing. Nothing can't exist without something. And yet that nothing can still influence and exert force on the something. So this is kind of uh, kind of a fun thing to play with. Now, Augustine wrote uh, about this, but he wrote about it in terms of good and evil. So uh, for him, he basically said that uh, good can exist in and of itself. There is such a thing as good. And the prime exemplar of that, of course, is God, right? God exists quite clearly. All of existence exists because of God's existence. And God is good. So good has existence. But, he said, evil, like nothing, it, it has no uh, existence in and of itself. 
that evil can only ever be simply a corruption of good. So taking something good and pursuing it in a wrong way or using it in a wrong manner. So uh, evil only exists as a corruption of good. Uh, you could think of it as a parasite, right? That uh, evil is a parasite upon good, but without its host, it can't exist, right? You, you can't have evil without a good that is being corrupted. And this, uh, this theological idea is kind of repeated down through the ages. Aquinas wrote that there's, uh, um, that evil is the, the absence of good. And Anselm, uh, he wrote as well too, saying that evil, evil is nothing. Evil itself has no actual being. But uh, evil, even though it has no actual being and is not a thing in and of itself, it certainly exerts an influence. So in the same way that this space of nothing is exerting an influence on the something, we certainly feel the influence of evil in our lives, even if it doesn't actually have substance in and of itself, right? Because evil itself is a, it's not a thing, it's a lack. It's a, it's a shortfall. It's, it's something missing, something missing the mark. And this is what prompts Paul to write in, uh, in Romans 12. He says, do not overcome evil by evil, but rather overcome evil with good. So basically what he's saying is that if you want to get rid of that lack, that shortfall, which is what evil is, all you have to do is put something in its place, right? So feed it with something good, something substantial, something that, that is real, which is why we're called to, to love our enemies, right? And uh, uh, be kind to them and, and feed them, invite them to the table. Because if we want to overcome evil, all we do is fill the void. If we want to overcome nothing, Again, it's the same thing. We just, we fill the void. So all I have to do is let something into the nothingness and, and its influence is gone, right? There's no more power to that nothing. That nothing that was lifting, well, the nothing has become nothing once again. And in that way, good overcomes evil, that the power of sin is broken, not through punishment, not through retribution, but simply through love. So, Love your neighbors, do not overcome evil with evil, but instead overcome evil with good. Fill that void with love.